Hey, I'm Chris Zepp from Make Everything, and today I'm going to talk about how I make money with my welder doing projects like this. Check it out. So before we get started, a little bit of an intro to this video. Now, the project I'm going to be going through today is nothing crazy. It's really not that unique. It's these utility carts for industrial ovens for a catering company. The point isn't so much what I'm making, it's the idea of building a business, using a welder and using your skills and finding a way to sort of facilitate your passion for making things into a way to make money. Um, it's a big thing. A lot of questions that come into my email and my uh, DMs on Instagram are about the business of my shop and how to kind of get from the hobbyist level to the professional level. And most people are envious of the tools and the space, but in reality, you don't need that complicated of a setup in order to do jobs just like this that can not you know, make you a millionaire, but they will help you make a little bit of extra money and at least help pay for the tools and the materials to do future projects. So let's get into this and I'll explain along the way. So this project starts off with a considerable amount of time on the metal cutting saw. Now most of this is going to be made out of 2x2x8 two by two by inch angle and there's going to be a couple of other different types of material along the way but for the most part I'm cutting and mitering this 2x2 two two angle. Now a big part of making money doing work like this is having the proper tools to cut your material up efficiently. Um, if you're doing things that don't have miters and are a little more basic, sometimes you can get a steel supply to cut up the material for you. But in my case, it makes sense to invest in a saw like what you just saw, the Steel Max, which is about 400 bucks. Now, for a welder on this project, I'm using the new Lincoln MP140. Now, this is a multi-process machine that does MIG, TIG, and stick. It's also super lightweight. It's like under 40 pounds. It's 110 volts. It's really an awesome machine for anybody kind of starting out that doesn't need crazy thickness capacity in their welds. Um, this was sort of an experimental project for me using this machine and seeing how it handled one of my professional level jobs using both eighth inch and quarter inch thick material. Now I'm clamping up my corners with these Ollie Iron corner squares. I've talked about these in other videos in the past. They're fantastic. I'll put a link down below where you can get them. You can get a pair of them for 55 bucks. They're awesome. Um, they're made by you know a, a guy in his shop, not a major company, and it's you know it's always good to support those guys. You'll notice that I put one of the pieces of angle upside down, and that'll come into play later. Basically the ovens that these are going to house need to be able to be removed and the front needs to slide off so there's going to be a threaded on plate there that's going to allow you to slide the unit out and just having that piece of angle upside down will be really helpful. Now welding on the legs can always be a little bit tricky you know you need to line them up I want them to be perfectly square in both directions so I'm squaring them up tacking them checking them and welding them. So the way that I get projects like this is, you know, I initially learned how to weld when I was in college. I went to an art-based college and I learned how to weld for sculptural purposes. Now, it wasn't anything structural, but every once in a while the professor would come by and drop your work on the floor to see if your welds held the test, you know, the quote-unquote drop test. Nowadays, I do a lot of repair work along with fabricating furniture. So... My biggest piece of advice to people that want to get into welding is to, you know, save up some money, pick up a machine, and just start. Um, MIG welding is extremely easy to learn, uh, and there's so much good content here on YouTube that you can check out. But the big thing for me is getting a MIG welder that you can use gas with. Uh, the results you're going to get out of a gas MIG welder versus a gasless one are much better, and the gasless MIG welders. Uh, the inexpensive ones can be, you know, really discouraging because the welds are just such poor quality. Um, with the MP140 that I'm using, it's like a great kind of hobbyist welder because you can do the MIG, TIG, and stick with it. So you can start with MIG 
and eventually learn how to TIG on it and do all that. The TIG setup is an additional um, accessory that you buy for it, but even still to have that capability in a 110 volt machine is pretty cool. And the capacity on it is 5 16 which compared to the 140 HD that I normally use for 110 volt stuff, it's actually a much better capacity. So I started in the business side of welding doing repair work. Um, people would bring me stuff that they broke, a wheelbarrow or a hand truck, and I would weld them back together and basically see how long they lasted until they broke again. Um, the big thing with welding is properly grinding out your welds and properly grinding out your material so that when you weld you get a good penetration and making sure that everything stays nice and strong. Now I'm not saying that you should buy a MIG welder and go out and try and put up a steel building. The stuff that I'm building right here is pretty straightforward and the ovens that are going on it only weigh about 300 pounds so it's not like they have to hold a tremendous amount of weight. I don't think that anybody should get into any sort of structural application of welding unless they're properly certified and learn all about that stuff. But for little things like this, I think that a hobbyist with some good experience can actually fabricate something like this safely. Now you'll see I'm welding on the insides and on the outsides of these other vertical supports. Now with the frame done and the legs on, these vertical supports are going on the back of these carts so that when the carts are strapped up inside of a truck, the fan housing on the back of them doesn't get crushed. There's also a crossbar on the top. And what I'm doing here is I'm grinding the corner of that material so that it sits inside the radius corner on the 2x2 two two angle that I got from the mill. Most angles is going to have that rounded corner, so if you leave it sharp on the piece that go, goes and butts into it, it wouldn't line up properly. Now I'm going in and I'm making sure that I have nice penetrated welds on all the corners of this piece. Anything that isn't welded on one side is fully welded on the other. And then I get outside and I'm using a fared uh, polyfan disc and it's really, really quick to get rid of the extra weld that's on there. Now this whole piece didn't have to be ground out. So sometimes when you do a welding project, you don't wanna see any welds. You want them to be ground and smooth. Since this is for a utility purpose, I spoke to the client beforehand and let them know that they would be welded. The you know outside corners would be ground, but the rest of them would be left alone and then it would be painted. And here I'm cutting up some quarter inch plate and these are gonna be the little plates that the casters go on. So something like this, these things need to be rolled outside. They're gonna be rolled on grass and gravel. So we went with a 10 inch pneumatic caster that sits 12 inches off the ground. I'll put a link to those down in the description if you wanna check them out. Um, these things are super heavy duty. They're 350 pounds each uh, rated. And in order to get them drilled through onto these plates, I do a little trick for kind of a production purpose. What I'm doing is I'm clamping together those four pieces a quarter inch and then welding four pieces together and then making another stack welding those together. And what I'll do is I'll head over to the drill press and I'll drill these out as one one inch thick piece of material. And I know what you're thinking, it's, it's a lot for your drill bit, but if you have a properly sharpened drill bit, it's really not that bad to drill through one inch. You just have to take your time and use coolant. You'll see I'm making sure it's extra tight in the drill chuck and I'm using a little bit of cutting oil and cutting lubricant which you spray on there and kind of peck through the material. Now by doing it this way, I get away with only drilling 12 holes instead of what would be 48 holes. And that's a big difference when you're looking at timing. Now I can head over to the grinder and grind those away and then the plates will separate. Now if you have trouble separating the plates, what I found you can do is just throw the whole stack of plates on the ground and they'll pop apart and break that weld. So this is just kind of a quick production way to get through stuff like this. Now, again, talking about this as a business, you really have to look at this as maximizing your time and getting as much done in your time as you possibly can. So by saving on that drilling, I save myself some time. I'm making three of these carts, so it's that time times three. It does make a big difference and it does cut into your bottom line. When I price a welding job, I charge anywhere between $50 and $100 an hour, depending on the complexity of the job and if I have to paint it, if I have to do any drilling. Uh, there are other guys on YouTube that talk about charging per inch of weld. On something like this, it, it's I guess I could have figured it out how much it would have been, but since it was kind of a, a freeform design, I figured I would just 
you know, charge based on what I thought it was going to take per hour to make them. I figured it would be about six hours to make each one, and they each one is about three hundred and fifty dollars in material. The casters are about fifty dollars each plus the steel. What I'm doing here is I'm drilling in a piece of three inch by eighth inch plate on the front, and it's going into the bottom side of the angle I spoke about earlier. And now I'm taking a tap and I'm tapping a quarter twenty. Uh, screw tap inside that eighth inch angle plate. And the reason I'm doing that is because when the ovens are on this, if they ever need to get to the front pilot light, they need to remove this front piece. Now on the other carts that they already have in their shop, there isn't a removable piece and the fronts get all damaged. So I gave the client the option and I said, listen, I'll drill and tap these for you just because it'll make it so much easier for your guys. The client was really happy with this and by avoiding using nuts and bolts, it's really only one part that they could lose if they lose anything. Instead of having to deal with a nut and a bolt, you get separated. So now with a Phillips head screw, they can take this out when they need to service it. The other piece I'm adding in is this crossbar. And you saw I just laid it across the top and traced it. And now I'm cutting it with the little porter band. And that's just going to make it so that the bottom of the oven can never fall out if it ever were to rot or want to sag or anything. Now doing anything three times can be daunting. Uh, doing anything ten times is worse, believe me. So, you know, you have to develop systems as you go in order to make these things work efficiently. So what you're seeing is me making the first one as I went through. So every one I made after this was that much better, um, that much easier for me to make, and that much more controlled. So the other part about it is you know i never changed the thickness of my material except for welding the plates on the bottom so i never had to change any of the settings on my machine i set them for eighth of an inch and this machine held really true i didn't have to do any adjusting and it just went um, over here you'll see i'm putting a heavy bead of weld on the bottom of this eighth inch plate and that's so that there's no weld on the top that's going to interfere with the bottom of the unit as long as these welds are in there nice and tight uh, you don't have to worry about welding the second side of it. It's not going to go anywhere. They're attacked on the top side. Now I do a test fit up of the casters, even though these things still need to be painted. And what I realized here was that there was just too much play in between the legs. There was too much torsional force, and they, and they wanted to move around. The last thing I want is for somebody to be pushing this thing, hit a bump or a garden hose, and have one of those legs break. So what you're going to notice when we cut to the next shot is that there's an additional piece that's added on all three of the carts that straddles in between the legs. The turbo can. And that's a piece of three quarter by three quarter angle. Now what that does is it really tightens up the whole assembly and makes it so that the legs and the boxes are that much stronger. And you know, this wasn't on the plan. I technically didn't have to do it, but I really felt that it made a better product. And it only cost me probably 30 or $40, but it's gonna give my clients something that they're not gonna have to call me back about. That's really important if you want to do this to make money is making sure your clients are happy, even if it costs you a little bit out of your pocket. Now here I'm just using this ridiculously large can of Rust-Oleum spray paint to paint these things with a black enamel. I gave them a couple hours to dry and then I brought them inside to attach the casters. Again, these are 10 inch pneumatic casters that sit 12 inch overall. And here's another part of quality control when you're doing a project like this. I chose to use screws with a washer on top, a fender washer on the bottom, a lock washer, and a nut. Now, that assembly is going to be really strong. They're not going to vibrate out, and nobody's going to call me back and say, hey, we lost one of the wheels. You know, what kind of crappy screws did you use? So here I am just airing up the tires, making sure everything's going to be good. These things are rated for 50 PSI. And now I get to drag the cart off, and this thing is done. Straightforward project, but, you know, going from repairs to this, you can make hundreds of dollars per unit on something like this, and it'll pay for your machinery and everything else. All right, that about does it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope it was informative. Like I said, it took me a really long time to learn how to price and do jobs like this, starting with repairs, then moving into light fabrication, making projects like this. They're not technically complicated, but they can yield you good money that'll help you pay for your tools or your shop space or whatever it is. Stuff like this helps me pay my rent um, and they are important to my business. Now, I did this whole project with the Lincoln MP140, which is under 800 bucks. It'll do MIG, TIG, and STIC. 
It's a really cool machine. I'm excited to have it in my shop. Thank you so much to Lincoln for providing me with this machine and the other machines. Check out the links down below to learn more about this and the current promos that they're doing for this machine. If you have questions, leave them down below. I wanna help answer people's questions about doing this as a business. I get a lot of DMs and emails about it and I am happy to provide that as a resource. You know, like I said, it took me years to figure this out and I wanna help the community figure it out a little bit faster and maybe not lose as much money as I have undercharging for jobs. So like the video if you enjoyed it, share it with friends. Like I said, comment down below, leave me questions. I wanna hear from you. Subscribe to my channel if you wanna see more videos like this, more fabricating videos, more creative stuff, more baseline stuff. If you wanna learn more about pricing and you want me to start doing more videos on that, let me know, I would be happy to provide that to you guys. I wanna keep it fresh and interesting here. And uh, I also put out a lot of content on my Instagram right here, at Make Everything Shop. Don't forget to check that out. You can see what I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Watch me struggle to uh, get stuff done in a timely manner by myself here in the shop. I hope you enjoyed it again. I'm Chris Zepp from Make Everything, and I hope to see you on the next video.